Jesus Christ be praised. What a great thought to be singing along with. Trust maybe that was on your heart and mind as well. Take your hymnals, number 613, as we welcome you to Faith Baptist Church here this Wednesday evening. 613, the trusting heart to Jesus clings, nor any ill forebodes. Singing I go along life's road, praising the Lord. Let's stand together and praise him as we sing. 613. The trusting heart of Jesus Go to the Lord in prayer, but the Tim Berry, would you lead us? Ask God's blessing in our service tonight. Thank you. You may be seated. Over to 648. 648. Jesus, my Lord, will love me forever. Now I belong to Jesus, not just for now, but for eternity. 648.
let the orchestra go down and we want to recognize anyone with a birthday today through next Tuesday. So today is the 25th. I think next Tuesday is June the 1st, if I'm thinking straight. So May 25th through... All right, I'm seeing a few fingers pointing. And then I'm seeing Leah denying vigorously, so that probably means it's Leah they're pointing at. All right, Leah, let's have you stand. Your birthday is what day? That would be Friday. I'm trying to remember, Leah, like, you haven't been here for a birthday before. And will you be 15? 16, I'm very sorry. Hopefully I won't make that mistake again. All right, 16 on Friday. And where were you born, Leah? In North Carolina. And moved down here how long ago? Almost two years ago. And uh, the Lord led her family to our school in the fall. And we've been so glad to see her growing in multiple ways, including in the Lord. And right up front here both boys isaac when is your birthday saturday and you will be 12 11 11 on saturday all right and lucas when's your birthday next tuesday all right we're getting a little ahead of it for you but that's great you can help us celebrate for a full week and how old will you be on Tuesday? Eight. Eight years old. All right. He's doing the math. All right. And uh, we're excited for both of them. And Jacob is up back there. Jacob, when is your birthday? Friday. Friday. Share it with Leah. And how old will you be on Friday? Twelve, Twelve years old. And let's see, all three of these boys were born right here in the area, right? Lived here their whole lives, so. All right, let's see, anyone else with a birthday? This is great to have these few. All right, let's sing to these three boys and Leah tonight. thank the Lord for all four of you. I trust it'll be a great time. I hope you take some time on your birthdays to just reflect on the goodness of the Lord and his grace in your life and, and uh, really thank him for what he's doing in your life. Make some commitments in the year to come. Anyone with an anniversary during this stretch? Tonight through next Tuesday. Anyone with a wedding anniversary. All right, well, let me make a couple of announcements. Yeah, one is the reminder that tomorrow night is the high school graduation for Easley Christian School. And we have a graduate. Where is she? There she is. Kylie is back there. Uh, be graduating. It's here with us tonight. And then uh, even our junior senior high choir will be singing several times. I'm sorry, Timmy. Timmy is also walking in our graduation, and uh, glad to have Timmy participate this year uh, as a part-time student, and he's been a great blessing. So we have several. I was thinking there was two, and then I, I don't know, it's Kylie's red hair, and I got sidetracked with Timmy. I'm serious. I was looking for Kylie's red hair, and that's, I think it just messed with my mind back there, all right? Um, but we're glad to have both of them and uh, it'll be a time of reflecting on God's goodness and a challenge to them. So be glad for the church family to come and, and support them. And then I also I mentioned, I was thinking I mentioned uh, Sunday night, that, that Sunday was Abby's last Sunday. Uh, tonight, obviously, is her last service. And then she's headed to Southland. And I was thinking about her 
uh, being at Southland by this weekend and several being at the Wilds. And we're going to actually, I think this is the only Sunday morning that is a required stay on the campsite. Uh, Sunday morning, there's some other times they have different weekend responsibilities. So uh, we're going to be missing them. But let me have um, all of you just stand so I don't miss anyone. Let's see that. All of you that will be starting at the Wilds, you have to report this Saturday, I think, at 4 o'clock. And we may not have everybody right in here. All right. And uh, by the way, this is the Goodwin's grandson uh, who is up, and he's going there tomorrow. But um, so you can look around, and let's just remember uh, uh, Abby and and all these that are at the Wilds, and we're going to miss them Sunday. But we're excited about their preparing to serve. You all can be seated. I uh, hope you turned around and looked, but uh, we have quite a few. And then just be praying, even over the course of the summer, their, their primary focus is uh, the camp week, but uh, there's typically a number that drive down for services, and just pray the Lord will even guide those that he wants for us to minister to, and hopefully be an encouragement to them. They always are an encouragement to us, so uh, that'll be a blessing as well. All right, we're going to have a special number at this time before we dismiss the kids and the teens. I don't know all of the words to that song and the variations of it, but I do know that part of it is, I have a home in glory land that outshines the blue. Am I right about that? Okay. What is it? I, I wasn't hearing all that. Anyway, something about heaven, and I'm thankful we have a home in heaven, aren't you? <laughs> uh, all right, we will dismiss the kids for truth at this time, and we will let the teenagers follow closely behind them. And I want to invite the rest of you to take your Bibles and turn to Daniel chapter 2. And we have a handout that I don't know that anyone has, so we'll get those to you. Uh, Daniel. All right, Mr. Whitehead, thank you. There it is. I've got a home in glory land. What did I say? Did I say that? I have a home in glory land that outshines, oh, the sun. That's the part I messed up. Yeah, that would make more sense, wouldn't it? <laughs> I was thinking that blue is greater than the sky, so. I have a home in glory land that outshines the sun, and uh, that repeats. I took Jesus as my savior. You take him too. Uh, so if you want a home in glory, you have to take the Lord as your Savior, don't you? And uh, perhaps even that simple message could minister uh, to us tonight. Daniel chapter 2, <clears throat> we're going to drop into uh, verse 44 uh, in just a minute, but this is uh, the end of Daniel's interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And most will recall uh, that Nebuchadnezzar had a dream of a giant image. 
And that image started with a head of gold and then chest and arms of silver, uh, midsection and thighs of bronze, and then concluded with legs and feet of iron and clay. And that image <coughs> remained until a great stone was cut out of a mountain and rolled down the mountain and smashed the image, uh, breaking it into pieces. <coughs> and the God-given interpretation uh, of that image was that the image represented a succession of kingdoms, of Gentile kingdoms, starting with Nebuchadnezzar himself, who was the head of gold, and we're going to come down to the end of it in verse number 44 of chapter 2. And in the days of these kings, the, this succession, successive kingdoms, Gentile kingdoms, in the days of these kings, shall the God of heaven <clears throat> set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. But it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, <clears throat> the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter, and the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof sure. Now I'll turn over, if you will, to chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7, and in verse number 1, <coughs> Daniel tells us that in this case he had his own dream. T chapter 2 was Nebuchadnezzar's dream that God gave Daniel the interpretation of. Now in chapter 7, Daniel has his own dream. And this dream, in verse 3, you can see, is of four beasts. And as we go on to read, those four beasts are parallel to the four sections of, of Nebuchadnezzar's image. And they represent the four, uh, the same four successive Gentile kingdoms. And perhaps some of you have continued notes, because even in our eschatology, we trace that beastly figure <coughs> right into Revelation. And it reaches its culmination point in the rule of the Antichrist himself. And that federation that he rules over. <clears throat> well, here in chapter 7 and verses 9 through 12, God destroys that last kingdom, and then we're going to read verses 13 and 14. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven, and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, <coughs> which shall not pass away. And his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed. And so we have these two visions, the first one of an image, the second one of these beasts. But both of these visions end with God setting up his unrivaled kingdom. And... When we pursue uh, further scriptural explanations about such a future kingdom, <clears throat> the amount of scripture uh, which points to that is actually greater than any other single future event. One commentator actually lists over 600 verses um, which point to what some have referred to as, as this golden age, this great kingdom which is to come. Those references are scattered throughout 23 Old Testament books and 15 New Testament books. So it really is a significant part of the Scripture's witness. And, and the nature of life in that coming kingdom does not just affect men. You can actually look, again, this one uh, put them in about a dozen categories. That is characteristics of the life in that kingdom. And some of those include things like animal life and plant life i mean everything about our life on this earth is going to be is going to be transformed during that kingdom and the uh while all of that is true and we're going to explore some of that the the primary characteristic though of this period is that there is going to be a living christ who is reigning 
after he has put all enemies under his feet. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And he certainly does reign now personally and individually in the heart of true believers. But there is coming a day in which um, he will extend his reign externally, physically, universally, right on this earth. And we're going to eventually again explore various characteristics of the nature of, of life in this kingdom. But tonight I want to start with uh, a discussion of the timing and the duration of the kingdom. Because even where we land on that is going to impact the way we uh, approach the whole study of, of this kingdom. And there are some intimations concerning the timing. And I'm, I'm taking us all the way uh, back to some very basic things that I really just kind of want to trace in, in highlight points, um, the Lord's witness concerning this. And the first intimation of, of this kingdom starts with promises that God made to Abraham and then Isaac and Jacob, um, and, and ultimately the pronouncement that Jacob made about Judah. But you can even just, I think, without turning, uh, you're certainly welcome to turn to some of these. I'll have us turn to a few, but... Without turning, you can think back to the Abrahamic covenant beginning at Genesis chapter 12. And there God says to Abraham that he's going to bless him and he's going to make his name great. He's going to, uh, a great nation is going to come from him. And he is going to make him and his descendants and one particular descendant of his a source of blessing to the whole world. So I'm going to bless you, I'm going to bless your descendants, and I'm going to bless everybody who blesses you and curse anyone who curses you, and in you, all the people of the earth will be blessed. I'm skipping over some of the provisions of that covenant, but in Genesis chapter 17, it's expanded some in, in chapter 15, chapter 17, but in Genesis chapter 17, one of the additional explanations of that is that God actually says to Abraham, kings will come from you. And later in chapter 17, God made it clear that the fulfillment of these promises would not come through Abraham's son Ishmael, but would come through just keep talking to me tonight, I'll help us all. It'll come through, not through Ishmael, but through Isaac. And Isaac had two sons. And God made it clear that the provisions of the covenant would not proceed with the older, who is Esau, but through the younger, which is Jacob. And Jacob ended up having 12 sons. And shortly before his death, when he was making pronouncements about the future of his sons, Jacob came to his son named Judah. And in Genesis 49 and verse 10, he said about Judah, the scepter will not depart from Judah. That is from Judah's tribe. The scepter was uh, the ornate staff of a ruler, was a symbol of power and authority. And, and Jacob says about Judah, the scepter is not going to depart from your line until Shiloh come. And, and Shiloh means he whose right it is. And unto him, he goes on to say, shall the gathering of the people be. So God makes this covenant with Abraham that he's going to be uniquely blessed. His descendants would be uniquely blessed. One of his descendants would be a source of blessing to the whole world. That was somehow going to involve kings coming from his line. <clears throat> and that king would have, to, whoever that king is, would have to be coming after Judah and would be a descendant of Judah. And then as we're tracing some of this timing, we want to skip forward from Abraham <clears throat> about 900 years, I should say from Jacob, about 900 years, and we want to come to a very prominent descendant of Judah named David. And we come to the Davidic covenant in Samuel 7. And you remember that King David wanted to build a great house where God's people could worship him. And God told David, no, for himself. 
But he also told David, David said, I want to build a house for God. And God said to David, I'm going to actually give you a house in terms of a dynasty. And he went on to promise David that one of his descendants would, again, establish a worldwide kingdom. So, so whoever that coming promised king is would have to come after David now and be a descendant of David's. And again, we're going to skip over quite a bit of territory, including references to Daniel that we've already looked at. <clears throat> we're going to go 400 years after David, approximately. <clears throat> and I, I'm sorry, we're going to come about 1,000 years after David. Daniel would have been about 400. But we're skipping forward now, 1,000 years after David, and we're going to come all the way to Gabriel's announcement to Mary in Luke chapter 1. And again, you know... So much of, of the, these details, Mary was a young, unmarried woman when an angel came and told her that even though she had had no relations with a man, she would conceive and she would bear a son. <clears throat> and now listen to Luke 1 and verse 31. His name would be called Jesus, and the Lord will give him the throne of his father, David, and of his throne there would be no end all right so again abraham's promise a descendant that would be a blessing to the whole world that descendant is somehow going to be a king kings are going to come that's all tied into that <clears throat> jacob says that that would have to come through the line of judah and now an angel tells mary <clears throat> that her son Name Jesus is going to get the throne of his father, David, and of that throne, there's going to be no, no end. So now we know that the king of this kingdom promised by God is none other than Jesus of Nazareth, that is born of Mary. He's the king. And then in terms of the timing, we're going to skip forward. In this case, just about 34 years. And we're allowing for the pregnancy, the life, and the ministry of Jesus. And we come down to Jesus' own interaction with his disciples. And <clears throat> there were other occasions we, we could look at where Jesus made comments. Like, <clears throat> now is not the, the time of my kingdom. And he actually said to Pilate, if, if now was the time, you could do nothing to withstand this. <clears throat> but... I want to go to Acts chapter 1. In fact, let's just go there. Acts chapter 1. <clears throat> and you can recall that when Jesus started preaching, the theme of his preaching was the what? The theme of his preaching was, repent for the kingdom of God is drawn near. And the Sermon on the Mount was about <clears throat> his kingdom. And he spoke a great deal about that. We're going to even look at the kingdom parables. We pick up our our series in Matthew. But when he died on the cross, the expectation of the disciples that he was going to set up his kingdom is just is dashed in pieces. That's why we see some of the disillusionment we do. But after the resurrection, their anticipation is now rekindled, even, even more than before. And they were out on the Mount of Olives, and in Acts chapter 1, and verse number 6, they end up saying to the Lord at the end of the verse, Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And their anticipation is that he's going to say what? I mean, they're anticipating this is it. It's going to come. But in verse 7, he said, it is not for you to know the time uh, which the Father hath put in his own power, that was to be left to God the Father alone. And then, moments later, he ascended up into heaven. And he hasn't returned in a physical, bodily form since. And the point for us now is that he, and I'm talking about timing, he and the disciples 
still viewed this kingdom as something that is yet future. They're still asking, are you going to do it? <laughs> and he just said, they're, they're asking, are you going to do it now? He said that now is not the time for you to know that. He ascends into heaven and he hasn't come back. But he is coming again. And right after he went into heaven, you can look again in verse number 11, two angels said to those disciples standing there, this same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. So he is coming again. And part of what awaits his coming again is his setting up of this kingdom that has been witnessed to throughout the Old Testament, now into the New Testament. And we're going to skip forward at least almost 2,000 years. And I do want to ask you to turn to Revelation chapter 19. <clears throat> and I say that we're, that we're skipping forward almost 2,000 years because <clears throat> we are not quite 2,000 years from the ascension of Jesus into heaven. And we believe, we have reason, <clears throat> as we've recently explored, that uh, to see that the events that we're about to read of being at least seven years from now, right? So we're, we're in that kind of time frame. And, and now we are turning to that next major section on your handout, if you're following that, the chronological witness of Revelation 19 and 20 concerning the timing. And I would just uh, point out that not every chapter in Revelation moves forward in chronology from one to the next, but the Bible students are in agreement that the events of chapter 19 are going to flow right into chapter 20, where we have even chapter 20, verse 1, the first word is what? <clears throat> and connecting this. And ultimately, they're going to flow, I believe, right into chapter 21 as well. So <clears throat> I want us to see, beginning at the end of chapter 19, right into the first part of chapter 21, kind of a, a chronological layout in general form of <clears throat> what's going to happen. Chapter 19 and verse 19. And I saw the beast, the kings of the earth. And you can even see those connections, right? We're making in Daniel. Beast, rulers. Now their armies <coughs> gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse against his army. And the beast was taken. And with him, the false prophet that wrought miracles before him with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceedeth out of his mouth. And all the fowls were filled with their flesh. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is called the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that he must be loosed a little season. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison, and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth, and compassed the camp of the saints about in the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away, 
and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which are written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man, according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And we'll stop our reading there. <clears throat> but our understanding of this flow is <clears throat> that chapter 19 is representing that great battle that ends the tribulation period, the battle of Armageddon. And <clears throat> the Lord will then, chapter 20, set up his kingdom and rule over that kingdom for a thousand years. At the end of that kingdom will be the great white throne judgment. And then we'll usher in uh, the new heaven and the new earth of chapter 21. And <clears throat> there's much, of course, we could look at, but tonight our kind of singular purpose has been to look at the timing and now the duration. So the timing, <clears throat> again, we're understanding it to be coming at the end of the tribulation and now the second, or the second coming in the millennial kingdom before the new heaven, new earth. How long is this kingdom? Well, we have a direct statement about that. And I'm going to look at five reasons for taking the thousand years to mean thousand years. But before launching into that, it might help to just note that we actually have six occasions where that, where that reference is made. In verse 2, Again, of chapter 20, it's, it's the last phrase of verse 2. The devil and Satan is bound a thousand years. In verse number 3, and the second half, he's going to deceive the nations no more till the thousand years be finished. Verse 4 is where we have particular relevance to the kingdom. Notice they live and reigned with Christ a thousand years. In the middle of verse 5, we have reference to the thousand years being finished. At the end of verse 6, we have it again, <clears throat> that they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. And verse number 7, and when the thousand years are expired. All right, so all the way back to Abraham, he's promised a king. And we just continue to walk through. Jacob is saying that king is going to come out of the tribe of Judah. <clears throat> Daniel is saying that that king is going to be the one to smash out the, the armies of the Gentiles. And we continue to, uh, David has promised that, um, that he will have a descendant that will be a king that sits over a universal kingdom. And Gabriel tells Mary it's her son Jesus. And he's going to have the throne of his father David, of his kingdom. There'll be no end. <clears throat> and we come right to this place and we see that that kingdom is specifically stated to be for 1,000 years. Now, I'm spending some time on the duration of it because some of you know that there are different views among Bible-believing people. Some don't take the 1,000 years literally. And so I want to try to argue for why we take the 1,000 years literally. And the first argument is number one there on your handout. When God wants to express time indefinitively, okay, he uses less definite expressions. So if God wants to just talk about general times, he can use a less definitive term. And we even have that if you'll look at verse number three. It actually says about Satan being cast into the bottomless pit and shut up in a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years would be fulfilled. And after that, that is at the end of the millennium, he shall be loose for how long? Okay, 
But what is a little season? What is a little time? We're not sure exactly. And the point is that right within kind of the, the same phrasing, there's a distinction between thousand years and a little time. So God's clearly able to and does express time indefinitely. But God can and does express time definitively as well and definitely, all right? And I know, you know, if I could just step outside of this even to um, other places in the scripture, I, I know people want to debate the literalness of Genesis 1. But when God says the evening and the morning were the first day i think that's definite enough but he doesn't even just do it that and the evening and the morning the first day and the evening and morning the second day when you get to exodus chapter 20 and giving of the fourth commandment he actually says for in six days the lord made heaven and earth the sea and all that in them is and rested the seventh day again god god nails down things like that in a very definite way and even in reference to this whole matter of prophecy, God can use definite expressions to clarify indefinite ones. Right? And I'm tonight, I'm really having to draw upon the fact that you've either been with us in eschatology or you're familiar with your Bibles enough, all right, so that I'm not turning to all of these. But back in Daniel chapter 9, he spoke about a coming period with 70 sets of sevens and he spoke in particular about that 70th set we often refer to it as daniel's 70th what as daniel's 70th week whatever that 70th set of sevens is and, and we talk about that last one because the bible tells us that a statesman is going to negotiate a treaty that involves the Jewish people and their holy city of Jerusalem. And halfway through it, he's going to break it. And he commits an abomination that makes desolate in Daniel chapter 9. And you recall that Jesus himself spoke about that same event in Matthew 24 in the Olivet Discourse. And he actually said, when you see what Daniel the prophet spoke of, the abomination which makes desolation. Paul speaks of that same event as well in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 when he talks about the Antichrist who in the temple of God makes himself that he is God and demands the worship of God. But in none of those references do we have a time frame. We have in Daniel, and we can look at some other things that we think are clues earlier, but we have in Daniel a 70th set of seven. Seven what? We're, we're not exactly sure there. Jesus speaks of it, Paul speaks of it, but they don't define it. But in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 6, in fact, let's just go back there. <clears throat> so we're right here in the same book. In Revelation chapter 12 and verse number 6, the devil is going to turn on the Jewish people like he never has before. And God at the end of that verse is prepared to feed them and take care of them for how long? You see it there? How much is that? 1,200 and a score is 20. 3 times 20 is? Okay, so 1,260 days. Look over to chapter 13 and verse number 5. Again, now there's a reference to this blasphemous speaking Antichrist ruler. And, and he was given a certain liberty, a certain authority and power was given to him to continue for how long? 42 months. All right, now... How long is 42 months in years? It's three and a half. How long is 1,260 days in the Hebrew calendar if every month is 30 days? How many is that? 
Well, we're back to three and a half. So here we have God, if we didn't know by now, like seriously, if we had been reading from Daniel chapter 9 and we weren't sure exactly what to make of it, we could get all the way to this place in Revelation. And there's another one here, chapter 13, that um, continues to nail down that kind of a date. Okay, we, we could have been reading right through here and, and we're looking for, all right, what is that 70th set of sevens? And we come to recognize that the midpoint where he commits the abomination that makes desolate and he turns all out against the Jews. Okay, that is the midpoint of a seven year period. It's three and a half years. And brother, what I'm just pointing out by that is that God can and God does express time definitely. Then he does it in some cases even to clarify the indefinite. <clears throat> and when we look at the term itself, this particular term, 1,000, is used literally again and again. All right? We have the six occasions of the expression 1,000 years mentioned here. All right? But do you know that the, that the Greek word for 1,000 is used over 250 times in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, which is known as the Septuagint, all right? But that word in our New Testament is used to refer to, think of this, it's used to refer to the feeding of the 5,000. Now, all of us as Bible readers read that the Lord fed 5,000 men along with women and children, and we know what 1,000 is. It's used to refer to the feeding of the 4,000. It's used to refer to the 3,000 that are saved on the day of Pentecost. It's used to refer in Romans to the 7,000 that have not bowed the knee to Baal. Okay, it's used earlier in Revelation, chapter 7 and verse 7, to the 144,000. It's used, as we've just seen, to refer to 1,260 days. In Revelation 21 and verse 16, referring to the New Jerusalem, it's 12,000 furlongs high and wide and long. So it actually uses it to describe specific dimensions. All right, so this expression, 1,000, is used literally again and again. And in addition to the, the usage of the expression, the fact is that right within chapter 20, there are other things in this passage that are literal. Right? There, there's some figuratism here. But there, there, I mean, I just started in chapter 20, verse 1. There's a literal angel who comes down from a literal heaven. Now, I think the key is likely figurative. <laughs> okay, but in verse number 2, there's some figurative. There's a dragon. But that figure represents someone who is literal, and that's who? The devil and Satan. All right? There are martyred souls that are literal. The Antichrist image is literal. We could go on. So it's not like we get to this passage and everything is symbolic. We don't want, know what to make of anything. It's just all symbolism. And here's one that's repeated these many times. And, and the fifth argument, and I know this one is a little bit of an argument for, from silence. But brethren, how would God express himself in some other way if he wanted to say a thousand years? Like, there's no other way for him to do it. <laughs> if he wanted his people to understand that his son is coming and he's going to set up his kingdom and the devil's going to be bound during the days of that kingdom and that kingdom is going to be for a thousand years and after that, the devil's going to be loose for a little time <laughs> and then the great white throne judgment and then the new heaven and the new earth, how would he do it if he didn't use this language? This is the only way it is. And, and all of that to say, God isn't playing games with us. 
Okay? He's using language that we know. And it's language that, as we cross-reference, is supported over and over. The only scriptural objection, okay, the only scriptural objection to understanding this as a thousand years is a reference like 2 Peter 3.8, which says, Beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. And what, what some have done, again, is, well, we got all these places where it's used literal, but there's one where, you know, it's, it, it's God basically telling us that we could never really know. All right, but brother, that is a really simple analogy. To say that the way we look at time is not the same way who looks at time. Right? And don't we all know that? The way we look at time is not the same way the Lord looks at time. And, you know, I could give an illustration of this that really, it, it's, it's far removed from the gap between us and the Lord. But the way a kid thinks differently about a year, okay, or, or a season of life is different than the way an adult does. Right? I mean, the, the way a kid <coughs> thinks about life is it's almost like the teenage years are never going to be over they last forever i'm never going to get through with them and get on the college or or maybe even i'm never going to get out of college it just seems like it's lasting forever when am i going to get on to real life an adult looks back and they actually sometimes tell kids enjoy and appreciate every day for what it is because it's like what it's gone it's so fast you don't think the same way about time. Okay, brethren, that's how, that, that, that's what 2 Peter 3, 8 is trying to say. It's trying to say what we all know, that we don't think about time the way the Lord thinks about time. There's just a perspective that he has. But this isn't to upend all of the way he uses language in the normal usage of it and the way he uses the word 1,000 all the way through the scripture and next time we're going to explore uh, the nature of of life in this kingdom but i just want to say even as we go um, to prayer tonight that we can not only look forward to this kingdom's coming i mean a, a real literal kingdom that Christ himself is the ruler of on this earth for a thousand years and it still awaits us before we even get to the rest of the nature of it. I mean, I've said enough that already ought to encourage the hearts of God's people, right? That Christ is coming. He's going to set up his kingdom on this earth, real, physical, literal. All the world's going to see it. And it's going to mean that all of his rivals have been put out, <laughs> stamped out. He's ruling. All right. Not only can all of us look forward to that as we go to prayer tonight, but we also ought to go to prayer praying for that kingdom's coming. And we ought to do that because he told us to. Right? He said, when you pray, pray after this manner. And that doesn't mean you have to pray the exact words, though there wouldn't be harm done in doing so if we're praying them thoughtfully. <clears throat> but part of our praying after this manner is, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom what? Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done where? On earth as it is in heaven, and certainly continue on. <laughs> and brethren, part of that, part of the praying for God's kingdom to come is, is even that, that God's rule would be expanded in my own life. I mean, that's part of it. Lord, take more control. The throne room of my life, take more control. 
rule more over the compartments of my life. And, and we can even pray that way evangelistically. Lord, through the gospel, win victories in the lost. And may they come to a sweet submission to the king. But brethren, in the world that is around us, seriously, I mean, this week, in the world that we're experiencing, and, and the way people think about it and respond to it, okay, doesn't your heart long to say, Lord, your kingdom come. People are saying things like, you know, put a stop to this madness and so on. There's only one who can put a stop to it, really. Right? There's only one who can put a stop to this chaotic world that is destroying itself with its sin. <clears throat> and that one is the coming king. And so it's right for us to even pray, thy kingdom come. And we can expect that answer <clears throat> to, we can expect that the answer to come in God's establishment of his kingdom through his son. And again, Lord willing, we'll pick up uh, here next week. Um, we are going to take some uh, prayer requests. And I just, I just want to mention, I, I, typical, I, I can't remember when I've ever commented you know, online in any fashion um, on current events. And I just find that there's uh, so much opportunity for loss of context and, and uh, to be misunderstood. But in light of some of the things I was seeing in response um, to yesterday, my, my mind uh, was drawn to multiple statements in uh, the book of Jeremiah. And uh, some are just talking about the weeping for our children. And you know that Jeremiah was known as the what prophet? As the weeping prophet. But I was thinking, what did Jeremiah weep for? And Jeremiah... Uh, did in chapter 9, yeah, there are multiple references, but chapter 9 and verse 1, Jeremiah said, Oh, that my head were waters, my eyes a fountain of tears, that I might weep day and night, even, listen to this, for the slain of the daughter of my people. But referring to his, his hometown of Jerusalem, he actually said, violence and destruction are within her. It's one of those themes in the prophets that um, has just been growing on me that where there's idolatry and immorality and rebellion there is also violence and there's blood in the streets it's a common theme and when Jeremiah weeping about the violence and destruction and the slain when he fingered the source of the nation's heartbreaking state and whatever else you, you might want to talk about and things that can be done and should be done. And I'm not denying the discussion should be had. But, but when he fingered the source of the heartbreaking state, it, it was the nation's departure from even literally paying attention to God's word. And they're rejecting God's law. Chapter 6 and verse 19. And at one point, even about sin and the nation's sin, he writes, were, were they ashamed when they committed abomination? And the answer is no. They were not at all ashamed. They did not know how to blush. Now, does that not describe our country? abominations are celebrated without even blushing of not paying attention or not heeding God's law and God himself as you know summarized the evils of the people as twofold forsaking me the fountain of living waters and hewing out cisterns for themselves broken cisterns that can hold no water. 
forsaking God and trying to turn to things that will never be able to work. And there's multiple actions, again, that can and, and should be taken. But, but brethren, um, we, we must see a return to being God-fearing people. And I know I'm being a little more specific with this comment, but we have to return to honoring God through marriages between husbands and wives <laughs> that are built on love and respect. And honor God through fathers in particular and mothers that raise children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And without that kind of a return, we are going to remain a broken people. And the violence and bloodshed that destroys a nation will only increase. And there is a lot of room for weeping. And I don't know how much you're catching, but in the last set of dozens, it's been probably since the Columbine shooting uh, massacre, really, you can go and you can just trace. These things are being committed by young men, and they're being committed by young men that do not have good relationships if they have any relationship with their dad. And in many cases, there's just terrible domestic situations altogether. I mean, I don't mean to be trite. There's other things that all kinds of people can do. But, but honestly, you know, we're ahead of Father's Day, but the one figure that could spare us so much is a dad. A God-fearing, son-loving, involved dad <laughs> would, would be the single greatest antidote to what's going on. But it's just... A reminder to us, brethren, that our contribution at least begins with let's fear God, let's pay attention to his word, <clears throat> let's, let's blush at our own shame. Let's ask God to help us not be able to lose the ability to mourn and grieve and blush at our sin. And then that we not be so foolish to move away from depending on him and trying to make life work apart from him. And by God's grace, let us, let us be some contribution to health instead of contributing to the tearing down. And so we, <coughs> we can even uh, pray this way, and certainly there, there'd be other scripture passages that come to mind, and there's things that can direct us, but I, I didn't want to mention that tonight. Anything else that you want to bring up tonight? Obviously, uh, by the way, just thank you for praying for the kindergarten graduation. I can't remember all the timing, but for one thing, the gospel went out, and, and multiple folks commented on that, from the singing to the verses to the catechisms. And then we even just had, a, I think, a preschooler that was parents were here and they decided that they were going to send the daughter to um, public school because of the finances and after the program uh, the mom contacted one of our teachers and just said I can't do that she needs to be here and uh, that's one little thing and and yet uh, we don't know what the Lord has for that one life and that family but extending uh, the ministry so thank you for praying all the way around pray for uh, tomorrow night and then these we've mentioned during announcement time that are working at the camps and uh, our own will start we'll say more about that sunday uh, next week but uh, a lot to be praying for there 